My name is Godwin. Um, I'm the chair for this session, and welcome to this uh, academic track. Um, we we'll just get on with the uh, with the presentations. Um, so the first presentation is about Marco, and uh, is about uh, intrinsic assessment. It's from Marco, and is about intrinsic assessment of uh, contribution patterns through exploratory uh, spatial data analysis. So please. Thanks, Godwin. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Marco Minghini. I work uh, at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission in Italy. This work is co-authored by colleagues from Politecnico di Milano, uh, Daniele Oxoli and Maria Antonia Brovelli, and also um, by Francesco Frassinelli from the Norwegian Institute for Natural Research. I would like to thank all of them for their contributions to this work. So, um, we all know that uh, compared to the uh, traditional geospatial data sources, one of the major advantages of OpenStreetMap is the availability of the full history of the data. And in literature, uh, we know that the history has been traditionally used for many purposes, mainly the so-called intrinsic quality assessment, which means in contrast to extrinsic assessment of the quality, that the quality is assessed not through comparison against some external reference data set, but by only looking at OSM itself, in particular the history. But OSM history has been also used to study the temporal evolution of the data in a region, in a country, or after a disaster, and also to uh, investigate the OSM contribution patterns. Uh, usually, uh, in literature, these studies have been focused on some uh, of these variables, so information on the contributors, um, where do they come from, what they edit, how much, how frequently, how many contributors are there, or how many contributors edit specific objects, how much uh, objects are edited, so many versions or revisions, and also information on the edits themselves, so what is changed, where, how much, how frequently. So in this uh, context, uh, the purpose of this work is to contribute to the study of OSM contribution patterns, not from the point of view of uh, creating new variables or new indicators based on the history, because this has been already well done in literature, but from the methodological point of view, and in particular by using exploratory spatial data analysis. To our knowledge, this is the first time that this is applied to OSM. First of all, what is exploratory spatial data analysis, or ESDA? It's a statistical uh, framework uh, which is aimed at identifying or uncovering spatial patterns and trends that exist in geospatial data sets. And in particular, I will focus on the concept of spatial association, which is nothing but the degree of similarity between observations which are close to each other in space. And the related family of indicators is called LISA, so Local Indicators of Spatial Association. In particular, our case study is the uh, area of Milan province in northern Italy, uh, where we had a great state of the map last year. This area is almost uh, 1.5 square kilometers and is sampled using uh, a regular hexagonal grid. With Actually, we tried uh, three uh, sizes of hexagons, uh, a side of 500, a side of 1,000 and uh, 2,500 meters. Then, uh, we consider for this analysis only the history of OSM nodes. So we, we extract for each cell only the OSM nodes with some hypothesis. We only consider the nodes that are currently existing in the database. We only consider the nodes having at least one tag. And uh, for us, a new version of a node is counted only when there is a change in the tags and not in the geometry. And we assess the spatial association between these uh, variables related from the history, which are mainly taken from the literature. The total number of different contributors who edited OSM nodes, the average number of different contributors who edited each OSM node, the average date of creation and last edit of each OSM node, the average number of versions of OSM nodes, and the average frequency of updates of OSM nodes for each cell of our grid. How do we do that using uh, an open source software architecture that you can see here? So the history of Node is extracted from the full history planet file. It is converted into an SQLite database with a Spatialite extension uh, using a custom Python script, uh, which is called OSH2SQL, based on the Osmium library. And finally, basically, we aggregate the nodes to the cells of the grid and we use QGIS to process the results, and in particular, we use the um, um, hotspot analysis plugin, as you will see in a minute, to compute the spatial association. How to do that? So, 
First analysis is the univariate one. Univariate means that we consider the spatial association, the local spatial associations between the, va the values of one single variable. And in literature, the most popular indicator is the local Moran's i. Uh, here, basically, the indicator computes for each location i, so let's say for each grid cell i, the uh, product between the value of the observation at that location multiplied by the sum of uh, basically the uh, observations which are neighboring, okay, Z. W is just a spatial weights metric which makes sure to only consider the neighboring observations and not all the observations. What is important is that this indicator basically tells us if the numerical similarity between the observation is statistically significant compared to the hypothesis of, um, against the hypothesis of complete spatial randomness. In few words, this means that if this similarity is significant, we may have clusters. Clusters are either high values of the variable surrounded by high values or low values surrounded by low values or outliers. Outliers are local patterns of dissimilar values. So either a high value surrounded by low values or a low value surrounded by high values. And this is implemented in the QGIS hotspot analysis plugin that is developed by Daniele, one of the co-authors of this work. So let's see uh, actually how this works. Uh, first of all, we consider here only the hexagon, uh, an hexagon side of 1,000 meter. Later you will see something also for the other grid sizes. And uh, we consider as the neighboring observations to each hexagon the six adjacent hexagons. So this is the average number of different contributors who edited each OSM node in Milan. How to read this map? So basically in red we have the high value cluster, so HH, high high, which means again cluster, so basically a, 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 a cell having a high value, so a high average number of different contributors surrounded by cells having again uh, a high value. So basically not surprisingly this is the city center of Milan. We know from the literature that the city centers are clearly the areas where more people map because more people live there, more people visit these areas and so on. Um, low value clusters, the blue areas, you see that these are actually peripheral areas, mainly agricultural areas. And again, in these areas there, is, there are less nodes to be mapped, less objects in general, but also less people active. This is, again, somehow expected. Let's have a look at the outliers, because the outliers can really tell us the local nature, can really explain the local nature of OSM. So HL means a, a cell having a high value surrounded by cells having a low value. So areas where mapping, or at least average number of contributors, is particularly high. LH are more interesting probably for the community because it means areas with a low value, so low average number of contributors, but surrounded by areas where this is high. So maybe areas that might need some mapping. All the other cells are not significant, so they are transparent. Not significant according to a significance level of 5%. Just to give you an idea of the added value of these spatial association analysis, I'm showing now a more traditional approach which is based on the same data, so applied on the very same data, but based on quantiles. Uh, in particular, five, you see five classes of, of, uh, of a quantile. So it's clear that we can still see where the highest values are and where the lowest values are. We can clearly see the city center of Milan. But it's also clear that with the quantile we cannot easily immediately, immediately identify the clusters and the outliers. And in addition, as you will see later, the quantiles are not uh, applicable in two or three or multiple dimensions. Okay, let's come back to the, our univariate analysis. This is the total number of contributors who edited the notes. So you can see that this is very, very clear. So when it, uh, we speak about the total number, the city center of Milan is clearly uh, visible. And curiously, no low value uh, clusters and no outliers are detected. This is the average number of versions of OSM nodes. Again, a very similar pattern with the city center of Milan very well visible. Again, these low value clusters somehow scattered in the periphery and also the, the outliers. Again, the outliers can tell us something specific about what is happening there. Average date of creation. So this is computed as the number of days between the date of creation of the nodes and the date we downloaded the planet, which is last week, basically. So, First of all, we notice that there are no high value clusters in the city center. If you are wondering why, this is because in the city center there are also many, many nodes created recently. So when we compute the average uh, date of creation, this is, uh, of course, not significant. What is significant here is this 
large blue area of low value clusters, which means uh, nodes created very recently. I'll tell you something more about that later. This is the average date of last edit, so similar story. So this is the number of days between the date of last edit and the date we downloaded the planet. So you see that again, this area shows very, very uh, recent date of last edit. Um, and the reason of this is actually then, of course, this means try to look at the date and see what's happening there. The reason is that uh, there is a user one single user that over the last year or so uh, started to map all the um, building um, numbers. So all the addresses basically, one single user. This is a frequency, average frequency of update, which again uh, points us to that area um, with high value clusters. So again, high frequency of update, mostly again uh, due to this user. But we wanted also to extend this in the bivariate case, which means we measure the local spatial similarity between the standardized values for two variables. Standardized is very important. Of course, when we compare the values of two variables, we need to standardize them. Standardized means mean equal to zero and variance equal to one. And again, we use the local Moran's i. The formula is the very same formula as before, but now the zj, so the neighboring observations, are not observations of the same variable, but of course of the second variable. So the, the, the interpretation is that now the clusters are, for example, a high value of the first variable surrounded by high values of the second, or low value of the first surrounded by low values of the second. Outliers are the same, so low value of the first surrounded by high values of the second, or vice versa. And this is also implemented in the QGIS hotspot analysis plugin. Some examples, again, here we put together the average number of different contributors, and the average number of versions. If you remember in the uh, univariate case, these had a very similar pattern, and it's not surprising that also when we put them together, this is the pattern, so basically the same, city center of Milan, clearly highlighted. Uh, this is the average date of creation of OSM nodes and the average date of last edit, so inverted. Inverted means that in this case, the high value clusters correspond to areas where the nodes have been created less recently, I mean very early in time, and updated very recently. So this basically never happens, only some, somewhere here. What happens, what is confirmed basically, because we already knew that from the univariate case, is that this area had nodes created very recently and updated very recently. Most of them actually have one single, single version. So the date of creation is also the date of last edit, because these are addresses. Then these two variables had a quite different uh, pattern in the univariate case uh, because the average number of versions showed us the city center of Milan with the high value clusters. The average frequency showed us that area. You see that when we combine these, basically we have something in between. So this area is also well visible. What I want to draw your attention on is also the significance level that is lower when we uh, have two or more variables. The reason is that it is suggested to use a rule of thumb saying, use a significance level, the standard one, in our case 5%, divided by the number of variables. Because when we have more variables, it is higher the chance that the combination of the two uh, generates some false positives. So clusters, which in, the, in reality are not clusters. So to limit this, we basically make the test a little bit more strict. Finally, multivariate case means when we put together multiple uh, variables mm, to again assess their local spatial associations. In this case, the indicator is a different one, is the local Gary C, which is actually based on uh, uh, the sum, you see here, the sum of the square distances between the uh, observations, the standardized observations of the different variables. So now the logic is a bit different because we have clusters when, suppose that clusters mean similar values. So when we have different variables with similar standardized values, the distances between the values in the, let's say, if we have five variables, for instance, it's the five-dimensional space of the variables, so the distance is small, the sum of the distances is small, so we have low values of C, mean, meaning clusters. The opposite for the outlier. So we basically look at the distance between the observations in the uh, space of the observations. Uh, if you think at the distance, you might well understand that we can determine if these are clusters or outliers, but not the type of clusters or outliers because it's only based on the distance, okay? This is why we actually created two new indicators um, that have to be computed after the application of the local Gary C to actually classify the type of cluster or the type of outlier. 
I will not spend too much time because it's quite impossible to really explain this uh, in, in, in one minute. Uh, I'll just say that it's basically mm, based on a comparison between, so this is the first one, uh, MMC for clusters, comparison between the mean of the medians of the standardized observation values at the location of the cluster and its neighbors, compared with the mean of the medians of the observations in the whole space. This one for outliers basically um, looks and compares the mean of the standardized observation values at the location of the outlier with the mean of the medians of the standardized observation values at all the neighbors. This is actually to understand the type of cluster and the type of outliers. The code of this for this is on GitHub. Let's see basically what happens when we do it in practice. This is three variables. Average number of different contributors. Average number of versions. Average frequency of update. The first two had a very similar distribution in the univariate case. The third did not, uh, any, because the frequency, if you remember, showed us this area. So overall, we can see that the high value cluster, so when these three variables taken together shows the highest values surrounded by highest values are still uh, present in the city center of Milan. Uh, low value clusters are again areas characterized by low values of all the three variables together, but surrounded also by low values of these three variables. Outliers, uh, outliers here shows a mixed behavior basically. So high values of the three variables surrounded by low values or vice versa. This is five variables together. Of course, when we increase the variable, we increase the variability of results, and this is why, again, according to the same rule of thumb, we consider now a significance level of 1%. Here you can see five variables together, so we also included the average date of creation and last edit, and you can see that basically the patterns are, are these. So in Milan, we can say it's, there's a clear activity in the city center. There are these areas in the periphery agricultural era, so these uh, should be analyzed to see basically what's there. The reason is that, as I said, there's, there are a few things to be mapped, basically. And then there is also this area where the activity of this single contributor is really evident here. Finally, of course, I, I showed you just results using a grid size of 1,000 meters, but you can ask, okay, what, what happens if we change the grid size? That's a good question, of course. And you can see here on the left, two distributions uh, done with the um, si hexagon size of 500 meters. In the middle, two, the corresponding two with the side of the hexagon equal to 1,000 meters. So basically those I showed you before. And on the right, the same distribution with the higher grid sites, 2,500. So you can see that clearly the results of the spatial associations detected are different. This is uh, obvious. So in general, we can say that if we are studying a phenomenon that is associated to a specific spatial unit. Suppose that we are studying the votes in an election. The votes in an election are associated to a district, to a province. So usually you should use the, the district or the province as a spatial unit. In OSM, of course, it, the things change because this is a kind of a continuous phenomenon. So it's up to you really to choose the dimension of the grid according to the type or the scale of the analysis you want to make. If you want to detect some very local behavior, you would probably go for a very dense grid like this one. So probably here the activity of each single contributor would be even more evident with a very, very dense grid size. So on the other hand, if you want to make an analysis at the sub-urban, urban or regional scale, you should probably go for a less and less dense grid. So to conclude, this is the first time uh, application, at least to our knowledge of the um, exploratory spatial data analysis to the study of the uh, OSM contribution patterns. It's still experimental, um, but I would say it's quite promising to really understand the uh, patterns underlying OSM uh, local contributors, even to the point to analyze and to, um, to really identify um, uh, contribution from single users or from imports or from mapping parties. Of course, um, we can also make some, let's say, uh, assumptions on the quality of OSM because, of course, if there are few contributors, if, uh, sorry, if there are many contributors, if the frequency of updates is high, if the data are very, very uh, up to date, of course, we can make some considerations of the possible quality of the data. As I said, this really outperforms the analysis based on quantiles because uh, it does not directly identify clusters and outliers, and it cannot be applied to the bivariate and multivariate case. Uh, as I said, the choice of the grid is very important and should be done according to the type of analysis you want to make. 
In this regard, the next step would be to try to make some kind of sensitivity analysis that is to see really quantitatively how results change when you change the grid. Okay, this is the abstract published in the conference proceedings. That's it. Uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Uh, Marco, for this excellent presentation, um, are there any questions? We have one mic there, and one is here. Thanks, Marco. That was super interesting. Um, really interesting to see exploratory data analysis applied to OSM editing history. Um, I just wondered, given the inherent bias of population, population density, number of mappers, had you considered normalizing the analysis based on population? Yeah, this is, this is interesting. Thanks for the question. Of course, we didn't consider it in this uh, experiment because it was just an initial experiment. But again, if you know what is the population for each single hexagon, so for each cell of the grid, for each spatial unit, of course, you could just give each this as, a, and as an additional uh, variable as input to the, to, the, to the algorithm, and you will get exactly how, for example, the number of, the average number of users varies with the population. So it would be for sure int interesting to see. It would remove that bias, right? Uh, even better if you could have the number of mappers in the hexagon. Yeah, but this is something in general different to have because the number of mappers, you, you never know where a mapper lives. So you can look at the, day, uh, the, the place of the first edit or, uh, you know, I mean, it's always something di difficult to understand really where uh, a mapper is based. But you can probably, um, you can probably, yes, find it at least maybe on a on a urban scale. So you can know if a mapper is from Milan or outside Milan for sure. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We have a question there, and then yeah. one more here. Um, you mentioned early on that you discarded any um, position changes for nodes as an input. Uh, can you elaborate why that is? Why you're only looking at tag changes? Uh, yeah, this was just a choice that we made at the very beginning. Uh, there's no particular reason, but we wanted just as for this first experiment to look at the changes in the tags. So not to look at all the small changes where a node is just moved basically from a place to another. There's no particular reason for that. There's a reason why we only focus on nodes and not on ways and relations. And this is because basically, you know, uh, ways means, could mean also highways. So highways basically stay more or even multiple cells of the grid. So at that point, we should have, we would have, ta we would have to take a decision on how to manage this. So, if considering a way as belonging to many grids, relations is even worse because relations are basically made of nodes and ways. So the updating of a relation means basically almost updating nodes and ways. So this is something we decided. We just focused on nodes just to see, sorry, we focused on tags just to see if we could get some patterns. Of course, next step would be to focus also on, on geometry and to plug basically this into the software architecture, into the scripts. and. But for sure this can be done. Thanks. It was a technical one. Um, how did you uh, manage to avoid a problem around the edge of your area? So I saw that you had hexagonal tiles which were cut in half by the edge of, your, of the area you were considering. Um, but what do you mean, in the algorithm or...? Uh... Yeah, so, um, so if you have one of your hexagonal tiles which only have, has part of it showing... Yeah. Uh... Um, did you, did you look at the whole tile then? Mm, here we just, no. This is, so at the, at the beginning we created the grid and we intersected it with the uh, province of Milan and that basically if we have half of the hexagon, this is our spatial unit. So this is the place where we count the nodes. So we didn't look at the whole hexagon because it was, part was outside the okay. province. So when we aggregate the nodes to, the, to their cells, we just aggregate nodes to that polygon. So because then I would have expected that um, all of those ones around the edge would be low value because they are smaller. Uh, it didn't happen. It, it could be. No, I mean, it, it might depends on what's inside the nodes, basically. No, I mean, it really depends on what's inside. It's, remember that it's basically the, the value, but always computed compared to what is uh, surrounding, what is, so what the, the neighboring observations are. So it's always something relative to what is, uh, basically surrounding that observation. So 
Usually, of course, when you have cases like these, you need always to take care of what happens at the borders because, of course, there are like border effects usually both because of the geometry, so there's nothing, uh, and because of the, uh, of the algorithm itself uh, that, of course, looks at the, uh, the neighboring uh, cells, but there are few neighboring cells, so basically what happens at the borders should always be considered with, uh, you know, caution. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you.